Welcome to Steve's Place. My name is Steve Elzick, and I'm your host for tonight. And uh, before we get to our guest, uh, Victor, let me uh, remind you, we have our conference coming up. I'll be in uh, August 9th to 13th at the Crown Plaza in Albuquerque. Uh, I encourage you all to, uh, uh, to make a to make arrangements as soon as possible. Right now we have a 40% discount on registrations. So um, uh, if you, you know, the earlier you register, the better. Uh, and then also we have, um, I'd like to remind you too about our, our YouTube channel. We have um, 30 years of innovative ideas in energy and health on that channel. Um, I encourage everyone to subscribe just go to my webpage, look for this yellow box, and that'll take you right to the, the, the channel. And if you don't notice below, I have a conference directory and a speaker directory. So you can click on those and um, and uh, see all the different conferences we have with a link to them, and also all the different speakers with a link to the playlist. So if you get a chance, go check it out. Uh, I encourage you to become a member. Um, subscriptions are free. We have a couple hundred that's not free. But, but being a member, which is $9.99 a month, you get global access 24-7. to hundreds of members only videos. You get everything. We have about 1,000 videos up there. You also get a member badge. And, um, and just when you join, do be sure to select the exclusive member option, you know, to get, to get the uh, global access. Uh, it's a great bargain. Considering that we sell these D as DVDs for like uh, $20 or $30, depending on what year it is, um, I would encourage all of you to go ahead and become a member. And now, with uh, further ado, I'm going to, here's Victor. Hey, Steve, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. I, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Is it? I forgot, I forgot too. <laughs> it's Sagalovsky. Yeah, so... So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a polymath ontologist trying to solve the mysteries of life. And uh, you're currently the CEO of... Uh... Yeah, co-founder, CEO of Lightwater Scientific. We produce, distribute, and promote the world's most deuterium-depleted water. It's a new standard in water purity, healthiest water in on the planet, probably in a solar system, and I'm and, gonna, uh, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna explain why it's the healthiest water that exists. Well, with further ado, I'll just turn over the uh, the screen to you, and you can take it from there. Yeah, hey, we'll get going. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. So, this is a story about energy, but different kind of energy. It's the energy that we use. So. I presented at Tesla Tech before. It was such a great conference about uh, alternative energy and uh, esoteric and alternative technology. So this is this is a presentation about human energy and what it takes to optimize it and what it is and and all this kind of good stuff about where we come from, where we're going, and what we can do to improve our health. So, uh, how do I, how do I go to the next slide here? Okay, there we go. All right, yeah. So, buckle up, because this is going to be a fun little ride. Okay, so, the nature of the topic is deuterium. And in order to understand deuterium, we have to know where it comes from and what it is. Uh, Many people, this is very new, but if you remember from your first science class, you'll remember that hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table and the most abundant element in the universe and also the most simplest element, the simplest element in the universe. So hydrogen is quite unique. It's what powers stars and it's what powers all life or uh, most life, I'd say. Maybe there's some life that's not powered by hydrogen, but hydrogen is really 
the spark of life and uh, it's what it's what uh, we need in order to live. So this all comes from, if we go back to the Big Bang, hydrogen was the first element created. And as the universe cooled, it left a little, some, a little bit of deuterium. And we're going to find out what deuterium is. So hydrogen being that first element right up there has couple isotopes. And what isotope, for those of you who don't know what isotope is, isotope is a version of an element. So particularly in hydrogen, hydrogen has two isotopes, deuterium and tritium. We don't talk about tritium. It's radioactive, half-life of about 12 years. There's not very much of it. There's some in the upper atmosphere. But deuterium is an interesting one. And the way it differs and the way all isotopes differ from the main element is that it has an extra neutron. So hydrogen being the most abundant element in the universe uh, is uh, the reason it powers everything, stars and, and our cellular biology is because it's so simple. It's a proton and an electron pair. And there's, as you go on from there, everything gets bigger. And uh, deuterium is of still hydrogen, but it introduces a neutron. So that makes it twice the mass of that hydrogen. So we can think of regular hydrogen as protium, or also known as protium, as hydrogen one, and we can think of deuterium as hydrogen two. Uh, now, there's very little deuterium out there. Uh, as you can see here on the slide, it's 0.0026 to 0.0184% of hydrogen is deuterium. Now, it also binds with water. Um, oh, and here's the, here's the visual explanation. So you see, the uh, protium or hydrogen one and you see deuterium hydrogen two the only difference is that neutron but what it does is it doubles the mass so it also combines with oxygen to make water and when regular hydrogen combines with oxygen it forms h2o which is known as water and when deuterium combines with oxygen it either makes a molecule that's a hdo also known as hod or a D2O, which is both are known as semi-heavy water or heavy water, respectively. So what happened in the beginning, beginning of the universe, is the deuterium is a transition element or isotope of hydrogen. So you start with one proton, and the proton adds a deuteron, and then it becomes a second element, helium. Unfortunately, the universe cooled too quickly. And because it cooled too quickly, some deuterium got stuck. And this has been a constant since the beginning of time. And uh, so we got to deal with this. This is deuterium is also known as the anti-life element, whereas hydrogen is what powers everything. Deuterium is the fake hydrogen that actually does a good deal of damage. And we have a small amount of this in all of our water. So here are the illustrations of the water molecules. Now, when we think of a liter of water, we think it's H2O. And a liter of water, technically, is 20,000 drops. So out of those 20,000 drops, there's six drops of HDO, which is not water. It's a semi-heavy water. And this is roughly one out of every 3,300 water molecules. So one out of every 3,300 water molecules is not H2O, it's HDO. And this interferes in our biological process. In fact, many are starting to believe this is one of the underlying causes of aging, is this deuterium problem. So as it accumulates in our bodies, the human, normal human body has between one to four grams of deuterium locked up in it. And the problem with deuterium is when it tries to occupy a place reserved for oxygen, all kinds of problems ensue. And this is what we're going to explain in detail here. So deuterium is everywhere. It's uh, because it makes a small percentage of all water. It gets into everything, all of our food and uh, everything we drink, everything we eat, all living species, plants, animals, so forth, and so on. So... I was trying to understand, uh, one of the things I'm 
just trying to understand in our biology is uh, is uh, mitochondria, right? And uh, mitochondria was, produces ATP energy, and this is the energy we need to live and breathe. So uh, I like this quote attributed to Thoth or Hermes, as, as within, so without, as above, so below. So, oops, what's going on? So if that's the case, <laughs> if that's the case, then everything down here should look very harmonious, you know, very lovely and wonderful, but it's not. That's not what life looks like down here, although we aspire for this ideal utopia. Instead, we have stuff going on down here that's like this. We toil and labor constantly for food. And the reason everything in nature is so hungry, the reason it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, is because of this guy. This is the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is hungry because it needs energy to make energy. So the energy that it needs is food and calories, which it breaks down ultimately to hydrogen and other molecules. And that fuels the internal energy production system, which creates ATP and metabolic water. So mitochondria uh, exist in just about every cell in the human body. And um, inside all of our mitochondria, we produce the ATP that we need to live and breathe. And we produce more than our own body weight of ATP per day. So it's a constant recycling process. And speaking of recycling, we actually recycle 1,500 gallons of metabolic water per day as we make ATP. It's uh, quite mind-bending that we recycle that much water. And that accounts for about 25% of our daily water requirements. And the other 75% is water that we have to replace because we constantly lose water, so we have to replace it. So, um, yeah, mitochondria is always working as the powerhouse of the cell. And uh, and that's why I have that little, uh, usually I ask people if they can complete that rhyme for me, roses are red, I wish you well. And mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And each cell has between, you know, 530,000 mitochondria. Don't quote me on that, but it's quite a quite a lot of these factories swimming in our cells. And as we age, we lose them. We lose these little powerhouses, the little energy factories. And this defines aging because a 10-year-old uh, might have uh, uh, 20 times more mitochondria in a cell, in that same cell, and they are when they are 50 years older or 30 years older, depending. Everybody, everybody ages at a different rate uh, when it comes to mitochondria. But uh, sure enough, as you lose mitochondrial energy, um, that defines that's one of the defining factors of age. So everything in nature is always hungry. Most of our time, most of it, all animals' time on this planet is consumed with trying to find something to eat because the mitochondria needs this in order to work. And this is the deal that was struck up over one billion, almost one and a half billion years ago. Uh, if you look at our cells, we have a nucleus and we have mitochondria in, around that nucleus and a bunch of other things in that cell. But let's just focus on the nucleus and the mitochondria. So uh, this deal was made about one and a half billion years ago that the energy production of the cell would be done primarily by the mitochondria, or at least the energy production of the cell that regulates body temperature, which is the newest information out there. And th this can be proven by the fact that we have two types of DNA. We have the mitochondrial DNA, and we have the nuclear DNA, which is inside the nucleus of the cell. And so we have this symbiotic relationship in fact, it's the oldest marriage in, in the universe or on this planet, at least, is this symbiotic relationship between the eukaryotic cell, the original eukaryotic cell, which became the nucleus, and the mitochondria. And the deal was struck that the nucleus or the eukaryotic cell would protect the mitochondria, and the mitochondria would create the energy and the metabolic water. And the other part of the deal was that the eukaryotic cell would give the mitochondria food.
because the mitochondria will not run without a constant supply of hydrogen. So uh, some of us were taught in school that 75% of our bodies are water. That's actually uh, not true. It's actually updated information. We're actually 98.73% water by molecular weight. So truly we are water beings. Every, just about everything, every molecule in our body is connected or attached to water. When it's H2O, it's good. When it's HDO, it's bad. So and you can see there's quite a difference between nuclear and mitochondrial DNA, uh, which, which uh, um, you know, there's a science that explains how this all happened in the beginning. But what I wanted to illustrate here is these are two organisms that came together 1.45 billion years ago, stuck up a partnership to create uh, complex life forms. Because without this relationship, when these, when between the simple and the simple cell, uh, this relationship didn't exist, and more multicellular organisms um, couldn't couldn't occur because there's the, because of the energy problem. So we evolved with this, and and this relationship ultimately evolved into the complex organism that's uh, speaking in front of you today, and that's. On the other end, those of you who are listening, you two are the complex organism that uh, has evolved over a billion and a half years. So this mitochondria, uh, the processes that happen in mitochondria are quite complex, but uh, everything, if we're to simplify it, we could say that, that it's just a, uh, it's just a factory that breaks down raw material, reassembles it into what it needs to survive, and uh, breaks down food into glucose or ketone bodies and ultimately in the electron transport chain, hydrogen, to create ATP. Some illustrations of what's going on inside the mitochondria. Uh, ATP recycles to ADP and back and go back and forth. Uh, sometimes under a stressful event, you dump all of your ADP uh, because it doesn't have time to recycle, and uh, this is why we get fatigued uh, from a from a very strenuous event. Anyway, moving on. So these are just illustrations of how ATP is made, and inside this uh, elect, there's a something called the electron transport chain, and then the electron transport chain on the very end of it are these nanomotors known as ATP synthase nanomotors. You can see them here uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a row. Um, and these nanomotors, uh, these are mechanical motors that are motor generators that spin. They spin the, the hydrogen protons, make the motor spin, and this generates ATP. So these ATP synthase nanomotors, they take a hydrogen proton to spin this motor. And these motors are quite incredible because they have a maximum spin rate of 9,000 RPM at 100% energy efficiency. Quite incredible. And so when a deuteron or a proton-neutron pair enters this ATP synthase nanomotor, it causes damage. It causes it to stutter and break down over time, and no ATP is produced in the moment that a deuteron, proton, neutron pair enters this ATP synthase nanomotor because there's just no room for it. It's like a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't fit. And this happens roughly about every five and a half seconds. So every human from birth to death is Every human from birth to death is compromised in their mitochondrial energy production by this substance known as deuterium. When deuterium goes into the electron transport chain, it's like a, well, it's like a elephant in a china shop. And now deuterium is not evenly dispersed on the planet when it comes to our water. 
uh, the oceans are all the same. The ocean is 155.76 part per mil, parts per million of uh, deuterium. And when it comes to our fresh water, drinking water, you have certain anomalies on the planet that have less than the average, which is 150 parts per million. So Antarctica is 89, which is the lowest on the planet. It's water that's locked up from 60 to 80 million years ago when there was less deuterium on the planet. And so in certain areas, you have less deuterium. Interesting anomaly being the Himalayas, where a comet had landed a long time, crashed a long time ago that had water that had uh, less deuterium. And uh, so when you're away from the hydrological cycle of the ocean, northern and extreme northern or southern latitudes, mountains, things like this, you have a chance to have less deuterium. So this was discovered in the 50s when they were trying to understand why certain populations in Siberia had an incredible uh, had an incredibly healthy population that had uh, seven to ten times more centenarians than anywhere else in Europe or or the world for that matter. So that's where this comes from. They these scientists, a young uh, biophysicist and a young gerontologist, wanted to make a name for themselves and answer find you know and uh, come up with a solution for this riddle because these people are essentially living like Eskimos. So why should they enjoy? a longer life and a longer lifespan, health span than a comparative population living somewhere in the Mediterranean in a nice environment. And after a few years of study, they, they studied everything. They, they looked at their food, their genetics, whatever they could. And then they came upon their water, looked at it, they analyzed it, and sure enough, it was 16% less in deuterium than all the other water uh, the, people, the average of drinking water on the planet and um, that's what started this whole thing now when heavy water was first synthesized in the 30s remember in 1933 it was discovered that hydrogen had isotopes that, that, that their deuterium even existed until then nobody knew that so once it was discovered that hydrogen had an isotope not long after uh, water was created in a laboratory that wasn't H2O, that was D2O. So you call that pure heavy water. So it's water made not with the hydrogen one, but the very rare hydrogen two. And uh, this water was synthesized in a lab. Now in nature, a D2O molecule only occurs in one out of every 41 million molecules of water. But in this case, because they were able to synthesize it in the lab, they made pure D2O. And they found that somewhere between the third and fifth day, when they gave it to mammals, you would die. Okay, so, it, so it's not metabolically compatible. And they said, deuterium is incompatible with our biology. And uh, the Russians went the other way. They said, well, what would happen when you reduce the deuterium in the water, much like these populations of Altaians and Yakutians in Siberia? Let's look at that. And sure enough, when they did, they saw that this population, like I said, had longer life and longer health span. But when they did the studies with plants and animals, uh, every, everything from bacteria to mice to, to dogs and even humans, they found that at, when you reduce the deuterium in water, unlike the opposite, when you increase it, slows you down and you and you die if it's a if it's pure d2o they found that when you reduce the deuterium from regular drinking water you not only extended life but you made things grow faster healthier and along this line of uh, of a less uh um less uh, there's a there was they noticed there's a less of a burden on our on our biology so they didn't really understand why, but the conclusion was obvious that if you drink water that's reduced in deuterium by 15 to 20%, this was the reason why these people were living so long compared to their, uh, compared to anybody else. So uh, yeah, these are the uh, some pictures of what these people look like.
very uh, Eskimo-like native uh, Aboriginal shamanic and uh, living in these areas where in the winter and six months of 30 to 50 below <laughs> Fahrenheit. So very hardy people. But over time, uh, they their genetics are uh, just fantastic for longevity. So uh, this is uh, the area where this these original studies were done. Uh, young gerontologist was uh, Berdyshev, and Rodimov was a young biophysicist. And then this was published in 1961 in the Soviet Union. And so I discovered this and. Uh, I wrote, I read an article in 2004 called In Search of the Fountain of Youth that alerted me to this research. So I really wanted to learn more because I've been an armchair gerontologist ever since I was a kid. I wanted to understand why humans age and I wanted to uh, get, just really have a, uh, the, the, the human aging pro or the aging process in general fascinated me from a very young age. So I am a health researcher and an educator, and uh, when I understood this deuterium problem, it really um, it, it really presented itself to me as something that uh, was an upstream um, an upstream uh, solution the the lowering of deuterium in your body for for extreme longevity and health. Uh, now, this is a uh, census that I found, a reference to a census that I found uh, that showed that the people in these areas that have less deuterium in the mountains there in the Caucasus and other areas, it shows that there was a, that 1,789 centenarians, what I thought was quite interesting was they have some record of people living to 195 and 165 years old, which is just incredible because the oldest in the guinness world book of records i think is uh, 122. so this is all fairly new like i said uh deuterium was discovered sorry thir 31 not 33 and um so this is all fairly new it wasn't if it wasn't for the discovery of deuterium as an isotope of hydrogen we wouldn't have the atomic age we wouldn't have nuclear power we wouldn't have nuclear bombs so it's a quite fascinating. And uh, over the decades, many scientists came to the same conclusion that deuterium is incompatible with human life. There was just really nothing that could be done about it. So it really stayed more on the academic side than, um, than, a, than translating into a product that you can use to lower your own deuterium. If you want to lower your deuterium, you go live in one of these areas where the water has less deuterium and then your food has less deuterium and then you have less deuterium. And it wasn't until 2007 that it was identified how this deuterium damages our mitochondria and, and how this deuterium damages our DNA and enzyme replication and all that. But in 2007, Dr. Olgun wrote a great paper that explained how deuterium damaged this ATP synthase nanomotor I talked briefly about. And like I said, it's purely a mechanical problem. You've got something that goes into the motor that the motor can't deal with. You have, it deals with a proton, but when you have a proton neutron pair come in there, it doesn't fit. So it causes damage. So we might think that six drops of heavy water in, uh, or semi-heavy water in one liter of water is not that much. And it really isn't. However, when you look at how it is dispersed in our bodies, you see that there's three to five or even more times more deuterium than the basic constituents that we need for life, glucose and all the minerals like magnesium, potassium, et cetera. So this is a problem because it interferes in everything. And uh, we're gonna explain some of the mechanisms a little deeper about how it does its damage. So 
as I mentioned, 110 pound human contains about 1.1 grams of deuterium. Really, it's about one to four grams, depending on your lifestyle and how how inundated you are and your body weight. But anyway, this is something that happens nonstop. So from the time we're born to the time we die, our ATP synthase nanomotors are getting bombarded with deuterium, which is not compatible with energy production and ultimately causes the destruction of not only the ATP synthase nanomotors, but everything upstream as well, or sorry, downstream, downstream, anything that's bigger. Uh, so eventually it uh, destroys mitochondria and those factories shut down. And this is why we have less mitochondria as we age, a prevalent new theory of biology. And this, there's a, there's a new branch of biochemistry that sprung up around this, and this is known as deutonomics. It's gotten quite a foothold in the last 10 years, and deutonomics endeavors to explain how deuterium is managed by the body. So this is uh, shows you a um, little uh, graph of what I'm talking about, that, uh, uh, that you, if you drink pure D2O, uh, or even a or even a percentage of D2O, I think uh, you die. You know, that's all you need to know. If you drink heavy water, you will die. Pure heavy water. But uh, in our water supply, luckily, there's not much of it. But over time, this is what it's doing to us. It's a slow killer. So These motors are spinning constantly from the time we're born to the time we die and uh, generating ATP and deuterium being two times heavier is the problem. So that's Dr. Olgun right there. He discovered this uh, reason why deuterium is incompatible with life it has to do with that extra neutron trying to get through the motor. As you see, there's the bad guy. And this is from his uh, theoretical biology and medical modeling paper. Uh, that's where it was published. Biological effects of deuterination, ATP synthase is an example. And the conclusion, there is a stutter and a shaking. And uh, when these motors stutter and shake, they weaken the membrane that holds them. Eventually, that membrane is so weak, you get leakage of protons. Once the leakage is too great, then the protons equalize on both sides and the motors can't spin anymore. And that's when the whole factory gets shut down. So this is an illustration of the ATP synthase nanomotor. And you can see the protons finding their position in place inside the motor to cause it to spin. And if a deuteron comes in twice the size, it wreaks havoc. So uh, this is a phenomenal little motor generator because it uh, looks exactly like something we would make, except it has 100% efficiency, which is something, something that uh, we're, as far as I know, unable to accomplish. So it's very, very efficient and spins very fast. And this produces the, the bulk, not all of the ATP in our body, but the bulk of it. And this is the problem is that extra neutron. If you woke up tomorrow and you were twice the weight that you are now, without any warning, how would you feel? It would be a, it would be a bit awkward and it would certainly slow you down. So that's why deuterium, I like to say, is an elephant in the china shop, just doesn't belong. It doesn't know that it uh, is not wanted and uh, it doesn't belong there just doing what it does. So it destroys things. And therefore, you can say that uh, over time, ATP production decreases as the stuttering of ATP synthase caused by deuterium increases. And so we have a young mitochondria versus an old mitochondria. And there's two ways that a cell dies, necrosis and apoptosis. And I was talking about this membrane leakage. Now, when the membrane leaks, you've got problems. It's like 
if your roof on the house leaked, everything would get wet, eventually everything molds, everything rots, and then that you can't even you can't live in the house anymore. And the in in the cell, this is called blebbing. When it just when there's when there when uh, the integrity of the membrane, uh, or mem when the mem when the membrane loses its integrity and you get leakage, eventually it swells up. There inflammation. There's a infl inflammation, and uh, and then it ruptures, and that rupturing causes further inflammation. It's a cascade that happens downstream, and that cascade ultimately causes us to age, get sick, die. So that bad neutron is the problem. Like I said, it's been here since the beginning. Uh, but the deuterium on this planet has been slowly increasing. So our biology is pretty tuned to limit the deuterium from coming into the electron transport chain. Well, let me put it this way. Our biology is made for a deuterium level that's about 120 parts per million. And the average is about 150 parts per million. And with the standard American diet, where you're eating three to five times a day, and you're eating mostly carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates are loaded with deuterium, uh, you're gonna be significantly higher. So we evolved to deal with about 120 ppm. Anything above that uh, causes problems. So deuterium is the first and most abundant naturally occurring toxin, harmful to life, and nature's strategy is to get it out. The Krebs cycle, essentially, is what limits deuterium. It's a series of gates that limit deuterium from the electron transport chain, but it gets overrun quite quickly in life, So, as this is something that bombards us from the time we're born to the time we die. And so we know that it destroys your energy production capabilities and pathways uh, by damaging the ATP synthase nanomotor. But there's also a kinetic detriment that happens. So when you look at the HOD molecule or HDO molecule, you see that there's a shorter bond between the oxygen and the deuterium versus the oxygen and the hydrogen. And this screws everything up. Uh, it screws everything up because of the kinetic isotope effect. So I'm gonna explain that here fairly quickly. Uh, when we think of quantum tunneling, we think of something like this. Uh, to, actually, quantum tunneling is more like this. And uh, for those of you that don't understand what this illustration is, it's this. So quantum tunneling essentially is what all life that we know of does. And what that is, is quite phenomenal because we, we cheat in order to live. We break all the laws of classical physics in order, life breaks the laws of classical physics in order to exist. If it wasn't for cheating and breaking the law of what we, of what is known as classical physics, no, no life would exist in this universe. And what I mean by this is this little genie right here, consider that a proton, a hydrogen. And so it needs to get from one energy state to the other. In classical physics, it would climb a hill. But in quantum physics, it goes right through the mountain. We don't know why, but essentially it's at both places at once. So it quantum tunnels, it, it cheats, it gets from one side to the other. Uh, like a genie, it just blinks its eyes and shows up and uh, teleports. So life is doing this constantly. All hydrogen does this, quantum tunnels, and no other element beyond hydrogen can quantum tunnel. Deuterium still being hydrogen does quantum tunnel, but not the same. It's much slower. So it slows down our reactions. If you, uh, this is, uh, you could see illustration here, uh, the difference in the quantum tunneling. This just shows that the deuterium is much slower than uh, protium, or hydrogen two is much slower than hydrogen one. And so what this does 
is it slows down the replication of DNA and enzyme molecules. And uh, this causes errors in transcription and replication. If you take a carbon-hydrogen bond versus a carbon-deuterium bond, you'll see that the, the deuterium-hydrogen bond disassociates nine times slower. That's quite significant. So this screws all kinds of things up. And in, and in the DNA, if uh, DNA is made up of hydrogen, so all those places where uh, all those all those places where deuteron takes the position of hydrogen causes it to change its shape. And if the shape is off, replication will be off. There's going to be errors downstream. So I like to say deuterium is like gum stuck on the bottom of your shoe. We want a high vibrational energy but deuterium is a low vibrational energy. So it's the equivalent of you getting up in the morning, having trained for months for your marathon, uh, putting on your brand new sneakers to go run that marathon, and right out the gate, you step in this nasty goo that slows you down. That's deuterium or HDO. So these are the uh, more illustrations of mitochondria. And where do you see the most mitochondria is the eye. Uh, it's in the retina of the eye. This is where the mitochondria are just packed like sardines. And so when you, you can look at the health of the mitochondria by looking at the, uh, at the eyeball. And the way you do that is by testing your reaction time. So, uh, reaction time is uh, is one of those things that uh, requires the cooperation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the quicker you are in reaction time, the healthier mitochondria. This is a simple non-invasive test that anybody can do to see uh, how healthy their mitochondria is. So mine is... Uh, level of a 19 year old usually, which means I could probably still go and become a race car driver. <laughs> but um, this is really, uh, really interesting because we have a solution that can um, reverse stop. Well, it'll slow down aging, but it can reverse your, your, um, your, how, how energy is managed in the body. You're actually, you can actually go back to the type of healing and the type of energy that you had when you were much younger because you can strengthen your mitochondria. You can reduce or remove the damage that's constantly happening to the mitochondria. And by doing that, you're actually reversing mitochondrial aging, which is quite incredible. That's why we call this one of the greatest uh, discoveries in biology of our time, this uh, practice of deuterium depletion. So just a quick review, deuterium damages the ATP synthase nanomotors that produce ATP, deuterium affects the electron transport chain, compromising oxygen carrying capacity, deuterium mechanically distorts DNA and enzyme molecules, causing errors in transcriptions, and this results in reduced bioenergetics, errors, mutations, and so forth and so on. And so, uh, as I was saying about the DNA here, 3 billion base pairs of DNA is what's in the human genome. That means there's 10 million deuterium atoms in our genome, or one deuterium per 300 base pairs. And now it's probably more. Or if you have, you know, if the average deuterium in drinking water is 150, and what the body wants is about 120, or in the 120 range, there's people walking around now that have deuterium level in the upper 150s and even in the even 160 plus which is higher than what occurs on the planet because of their dietary choices and lifestyle so as you can see when deuterium takes the place of a hydrogen being that it's twice the mass it can distort the beautiful double helix shape of the dna which causes errors in transcription because of that kinetic isotope effect in the replication. 
it slows everything down. So a lot of studies out there on deuterium and uh, what deuterium does. Um, this was a very interesting one, shows that, uh, that uh, higher deuterium in our bodies uh, interferes with the repair process of DNA, as I mentioned. And uh, there's a website that I created called deuteriumdepletion.org. And if you're interested, most of the studies that I could find uh, over the last 60 years in every language are there. If you go to Wikipedia and you look under deuterium depleted water, unfortunately, we're, we're highly censored. Uh, every time we try to add to the Wikipedia, the next day they take it off. And I suspect the reason for that is because a scientist back in the 90s had discovered that the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium is what turns oncogenes on and off. And so an oncogene is a gene that would give you a higher risk of cancer. And when you have more deuterium, and that ratio is skewed toward deuterium, the hydrogen deuterium ratio, or the hydrogen one to hydrogen two ratio, uh, you have uh, more instances or more risk of neoplastic condition, which is cancer. Sure enough, number of deaths from cancer per 100,000 people of specified age as DNA errors accumulate, so does the cancer. Hmm. It's logical. So we start out as a hydrogen fueled funny car. And at the end of our life, we can barely make it to the finish line. We're a uh, ox hauling a near dead carcass to the finish. And that's because we don't have the cellular energy anymore. And that cellular energy is mitochondrial. So in order to keep our motors running, these beautiful ATP synthase nanomotors, we need pure water and pure water is H2O. There's no D in that equation. And uh, this 6X means 6X proton motor force. That is the theoretical increase in the amount of protons that your ATP synthase nanomotors can transport. Uh, I say theoretical because the conditions have to be just right. However, on a practical level, when you reduce your deuterium levels by 20%, you can get 2x proton motor force and maybe even more. And that's phenomenal because what that means is your oxygen carrying capacity is radically increased, doubled or even more. So when we look at, uh, let's go a little bit uh, more macro from up from the mitochondria, up from the DNA, everything in our bodies is works in this spiral double helix principle. And so does collagen. Collagen is a coil within a coil within a coil. And collagen is a favorite subject of mine because this is what, uh, this is, uh, what betrays our physical age, you know, uh, because of the skin, right? How healthy is your skin? When you're young, it's nice and smooth. And when you're old, it's full of wrinkles. So, because of this kinetic isotope effect, collagen is severely affected by accumulation of deuterium. And it being a coil within a coil within a coil, as it replicates, the more deuterium, the more chance of errors. And the more chance of errors, the more breaks in the collagen fibers. And you get the idea. And this is because, um, so, Collagen and certain enzymes display this phenomenon known as chirality. In fact, there's many molecules in our body known as stereoisomers. And what, what these are are mirror opposites of one another. And it's important that they're identical. It's as if you are flying a plane and the wings look the same, but one wing is slightly heavier than the other. It's going to be a lot harder to fly 
and more likely than not, it will cause you to crash. So when you have these stereo molecules and one side has a hydrogen and the other side has deuterium, they're not identical. One's heavier than the other. And this creates problems in uh, enzyme replication and ultimately leading up to collagen. And this is why you have a breakdown as we age. So sure enough, this is a study out of China that showed, uh, here's a collagen layer, and it showed that when you topically put deuterium depleted water on your, on the, in this case, uh, of the skin, you see that the collagen layer doubled in thickness. It's phenomenal. Anybody that cares about their skin and how nice it looks will take notice because as you can see, the average deuterium level in water, 150 ppm versus the 50 ppm, and then 132, which our bi biology is more attuned to, uh, is uh, somewhere in between. So this is exciting because this is proof of the theoretical understanding that I just explained. And so I like to use this example of this uh, this one particular uh, martial arts master, this Chinese master that lived to 118 years old. And if you go to YouTube, you can see videos of him performing his art all the way up to 117 years old. And he's quite fluid. He moves like a healthy person would move at any age that was quite a, that it was accomplished in martial arts because even at 117 if you're not skilled in this art you won't even come close to looking as good as he does at 20 years old and he's 117 but it's a, this is a lifetime of practice and so what's interesting when i look at these really li long lived people uh you know did you know that uh, the chances of a centenarian, somebody that's reached 100 years of age, to make it to 110 is only one out of 700. So one out of, one out of, only one out of 700 centenarians will make another 10 years. And they all have something quite phenomenal in common. They all have really good skin that I noticed. So I study these long-lived peoples, 110 plus, and they all have really good skin. And that means that uh, they have good collagen. That means they have less deuterium breaking down their biology. And in this case, this uh, master practiced an art, uh, or he was uh, skilled in many aspects of, of, uh, of martial art, but uh, particularly in Bagua, which utilizes spiral movements. So this gentleman practiced spiral movements constantly throughout his whole life quite interesting because I think that really gave him the longevity because everything in our bodies, as I said, is a coil within a coil, a spiral within a spiral. So as above, so below. And so one out of 700 centenarians will make it to 110. And we don't really understand why. And this is something that I like to study to really get an understanding of what causes us to age so rapidly, much like a snowball effect, that at the very end of life, we age exponentially faster than when we're younger. And this has, I think, has a lot to do with the accumulation of deuterium and a few other factors. But deuterium is a, is a really big one. So here we have one of the, here we have a potential solution for the aging problem. Here's a couple other 110-year-olds, as you can see, what they have in common. Now, what they what they don't have in common is diet. They, they, none of these people, none of these centenarians that I've researched have the same philosophy of longevity or the same diet, but what they all do have is pretty good skin. So that cellular integrity in the collagen works its way all, works its way down all the way to the DNA and somehow they're able to manage the deuterium better than the rest of us. There are genetic factors as well. Now, uh, 
as I said, deuterium has not been constant and we had less deuterium on the planet. And when Homo sapiens evolved 120,000 years ago, we had 20% less deuterium than we have now. So the lowest deuterium on the planet, as I mentioned, is in Antarctica, where it's 89 parts per million, which is incredible considering that the oceans are 155 parts per million and standard tap water, most anywhere, at least coastal, on this planet is 150 parts per million. So this is water locked up in time as if it was frozen overnight. And this is what Antarctica used to look like. And in the past, in the, in the distant past, millions of years ago, we had larger animals like giant dinosaurs. We had larger plants like three-story ferns. And this has a lot to do with the fact that the planet had less deuterium and more, slightly more oxygen. But because there was less deuterium, you were able to use the oxygen much better. Life was able to use the oxygen much better and this translated to being bigger and also living longer and uh, i like to study this i like to study esoteric history and and uh just you know journey into the past and there's evidence that there were giant trees in the past and there's even evidence that at one time in our past, we actually did live in a utopia of harmony with technology and um, a time when that we all crave right now, right? Uh, a time of high technology, but uh, but uh, um, in a in a in a way that in a way that was harmonious with humans in a way that promoted harmony amongst humans. But sure enough, every time it seems that we come to a revelation of understanding and a point in our evolution where we arrive at utopia, it gets destroyed and we have to start from scratch all over again. <laughs> and so uh, I thought this was interesting when you look at the average beaver today versus the pre-flood beaver, you see that the pre-flood beaver is like three to four times bigger. And there was less deuterium before the flood, whatever the flood was. The flood introduced more deuterium to our planet. And if you look at, if you believe uh, the Bible as literature, or as a historical record, you'll see that in the line of patriarchs, something quite interesting happens after the flood. You have the original humans living 900 years and above. And after the flood, lifespans quickly decreased to what we have today, somewhere in the 120 year range. So whatever this flood was, it introduced a whole bunch of deuterium to our planet and that decreased our size, decreased our lifespan and made us more susceptible to disease. And some even think that, or so, there's some evidence that uh, humans were giants. Some even say that Noah and his descendants were 10 to 15 feet tall. And there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence for these these races of giants all around the planet, all the way down to giant femurs left over in skulls. And this is, this is a hidden archaeology, if you will. And uh, over time, we've shrunk to where we are today. Once in a while, genetically, uh, the, uh, that giant gene expresses itself. It, it, there's a reverse of genetics. And this is why we have sometimes people that are eight and nine feet tall, and uh, whether that's true or not, uh, we don't know, but you can't argue with the mega penguin. There's the penguin from that time on the earth when we had less deuterium compared to the penguin of today. It just shrunk over time. So we know that earth's water is heavy and, uh, and this is a problem. And this is a problem because if we ever hope to go to the stars, 
Uh, we need water that is deuterium depleted. For example, when we get to Mars, on Mars, it's five to seven more deuterium than there is on the planet. So if we get to Mars, if we ever do get to Mars, when they get there, if they don't have a way to create water that is deuterium depleted, they will quickly age and die within a matter of a year or slightly more. So I wrote an article. I encourage anybody interested in this subject uh, to search for this article online, which is on Medium, Deuterium, the Elephant, the Space Capsule. It's about a 12-minute read, and it makes a case for why we need deuterium-depleted water if we ever hope to exist outside the confines of our planet or successfully exist outside the confines of our planet. I also looked at other, I looked at everything on deuterium when I first got into this and saw this as a top level intervention for longevity and uh, really a revelation in human biology. So I looked at everything I possibly could, any reference that I could find about deuterium and I found this, which was quite interesting, uh, Wes Bateman was a claim to be a contactee. He had telepathic communication with extraterrestrials. This is in his book written in 1993, where he asked the extraterrestrials how long they lived. They told him they lived quite a long time, up to thousands of years. Uh, then he wanted to find out why we don't live why we barely scratch, why we, why, why we can barely uh, make it over a hundred. And they explained to him that on our planet, we have this problem of too much deuterium. This was in 1993. Another contactee named Billy Meyer, I found in 1973 in his lectures, uh, essentially the same, had concluded the same thing. Direct, asked the director, asked his, according to him, he asked his, extraterrestrial contacts, why we age so fast. And they said the same thing. We have too much deuterium on our planet. I thought this was really interesting because uh, this was not very well known about in the 90s. It's almost unknown about. So now, Wes Bateman, who wrote this book, could have just could have just read this, you know. I don't know if I don't know if this alien stuff is real or not. I'd like to believe. Uh, of course, I don't really see much evidence of it. So anything without evidence is easy to refute. But uh, this is a excerpt from uh, J.F. Thompson's work in the fifties, where he concluded that uh, deuterium was incompatible with life. So I was looking at this Himalayan region, which is an anomaly up there in Mount Everest, where there's less deuterium. And I looked at the Sherpas. I find them very interesting because they are a local people that can climb Mount Everest to the summit without supplemental oxygen, whereas Western climbers, they will pass out and die from hypoxia if they attempt this feat. And so these Sherpas, they carry their bags and gear and they don't even have any oxygen and for them to get to the summit is quite standard it's quite uh, normal and for westerners it's not well when you look at it in depth you see that the local population there is deuterium depleted because the water in mount everest or at base camp and thereabouts is about 20 percent lower in deuterium than everywhere else. And sure enough, when Western climbers go there and acclimate for three to six months in the area, along with a ketogenic diet, which promotes deuterium depletion, they too can summit Mount Everest without oxygen. So uh, this, to me, explains why the Sherpas can summit Mount Everest, because they have lower deuterium in their bodies. It's what is the mechanism of acclimation? This is the mechanism, the lower deuterium. And the reason they can do this is because, as I mentioned earlier, you can just about double your oxygen carrying capacity when you have 20% or more less deuterium in the body. 
So one of the ways to lower deuterium in the body is to eat a ketogenic or keto adapted body. A ketogenic diet or a ketogenic diet strategy is a deuterium depletion strategy. Not only does fat produce uh, three or four times more ATP than glucose, but it also, fat has less deuterium. Nature's strategy is to load the carbs with deuterium and deplete the fats. So fats are 15 to 25% lower in deuterium than carbs. So ketogenic strategy becomes very important if you want to deplete your deuterium. Reduce the burden. The other way to do it is to drink deuterium depleted water. And this is the whole point of our company is we make a water that's deuterium depleted. So when you drink deuterium depleted water or light water, as our water is called, uh, you over time reduce the deuterium burden in your body. Every day you can reduce by about half a ppm of deuterium when you drink half a liter to one liter of our light water. And uh, one of the reasons it's called lighter is not only because uh, the lowering of deuterium in the body actually does make you lighter. It takes away a lot of the heavy burden on the energy producing pathways. But when you put it on a scale, when you put, when you take a glass of regular water and put it on a scale next to light water, there is a difference in physical weight because deuterium is double the mass of protium. Hydrogen two is double the mass of hydrogen one. So unfortunately, there's no standard purification process that will take deuterium out of water, that will make deuterium depleted water. You either go to some of these places on the planet that have less deuterium and live there, or you buy our water, uh, or we have three competitors. There's only four companies in the world, uh, actually four or five companies in the world that can produce deuterium depleted water. And what we've done is we've We've uh, uh, figured out how to mimic the hydrological cycle inside um, a uh, commercial production facility. And the reason no standard filtration will remove deuterium, that standard distillation, uh, reverse osmosis, is because you're not taking a contaminant out of the water like a chemical, like a fluoride or chlorine or a heavy metal, you're actually trying to separate a type of water from another type of water. So they're so close, these two molecules, the H2O and the HOD, that you have to have some very specialized equipment, very specialized equipment that takes an enormous amount of power to operate. So nothing you can do at home. And this is our, uh, some pictures from our factory. On the left is a original production prototype going on almost 20 years ago. And then this is what a part of our factory looks like on the right. It's a series of 40 foot tall columns that are working 24 seven to separate the light water from the regular water. And it's called vacuum assisted rectification distillation. That's me at our factory, uh, very happy because I love deuterium depleted water. It's done, it's done phenomenal things for me and uh, all of our customers as well. Because when you lower your burden of deuterium in your body by 20%, you, you get ahead of this, uh, this um, increase or, or this, uh, um, this rapid process known as aging. So what do we have here? Do we have a fountain of youth? In many practical aspects, yes. What we have here with deuterium depleted water or the deuterium depleted lifestyle essentially is a type of fountain of youth, but what it really is, is drinking water that's 
closer to the water or almost identical to the water that's inside your mitochondria, known as metabolic water. So our metabolic water, the water inside our cells, inside our mitochondria, is not water that we drank. It's water that we synthesize. We made it from scratch. And this water, in the process, as a byproduct or uh, part of the process of producing ATP energy. So this metabolic water is 50 to 70% lower in deuterium than standard drinking water. So what light water is, is water that is closer to your metabolic water than any other water that exists. So it's a new standard in water purity. And I think eventually everybody will adopt this standard. It's just a very difficult process to do. And as time goes on and this science and the benefits of this is more recognized, more processes, more people will get interested in creating so in, 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 in solving some of these uh, problems that we don't have solutions for, namely how to make more of this at a cheaper price. Now, if this was 20 years ago, a liter of deuterium depleted water would cost you 800 to $1,000, and we got it down to 18 to 20 bucks a liter. Still high, but you don't need more than half a liter to a liter a day. And... Uh, the benefits are over uh, if after three months you will lower your deuterium uh, down into the 120 ppm range and just maintain it there if you're a competitive athlete or if you have some health condition you may want to go lower but that's the that that uh, the bulk of the benefit is in dropping that first chunk of 30 points from 150 to 120 plus and so we have a protocol that you can follow uh, from our website. Now, you can either mix our light water, which is 10 parts per million or five parts per million with the water that you drink for a very clinical approach, a very linear approach in depleting your deuterium, or you can just drink half a liter to a liter of this per day, and you will still lower deuterium in your body over time. And uh, if you're dealing with some kind of... Uh, health issue, I recommend a more linear approach and not one that's like this as you deplete. So to get more linear, you just you just know how much water you're going to drink per day and then you pre-mix everything so you know ahead of time. Oh. Um, Steve, I can't get to the next slide. You're at the end of them, slide 100. Ah, there's more actually. That's weird. Anyway, but that's pretty much it. Uh, there are there are a few more slides. There's probably six, six or seven more slides. And uh, I don't know why it won't go any more, any further. But I think you guys, I think everybody gets the idea that uh, this is something we should have on our radar is uh, this deuterium problem. And if you don't drink deuterium depleted water, like I said, you can you can decrease your deuterium by more ketogenic diet, you can practice intermittent fasting, you could eat less carbs, exercise more. These are all ways to lower your, your deuterium. Uh, stop snack, stop, stop snacking on uh, stuff that has all these uh, uh, these bad oils in them, like vegetable oils, are just full of deuterium. So uh, eat more, um, eat more fats. Uh, that's it. Sorry, sorry. I don't know why. I don't know why the uh, the other slides won't load. I think it's something to do with the limitations of Streamyard. Yeah. Yeah. They don't let, won't let you go over 100. Yeah, I think I have like 108 or 109 slides total. So I thought so, it was higher. I thought it was the number was higher because we had to split up a we had to split up a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'm I'm going to start putting them on 90 slides. You can break it into two at that point. 
Yeah, it must be a stream yard limitation. It is. But there you have the science. There you have some of the history. There you have some of the practice and protocol. You have a little bit of the history about us. And um, and it's just a very exciting future because of uh, because of this not only the, not only this discovery that's been known about for 60 plus years but because now you can do something about it you can you can um... well we have a question for you how long does light water last well it'll last it'll last it'll last you're not going to change the deuterium concentration in the water unless you add other water so if you have a bottle of light water you'll you know if you if you leave to go outer space and you come back in a million years it'll still probably be 10 parts per million so it's not going to uh change uh only by the addition of other water will you change the amount of deuterium in water and we take out 94 to 97 percent of the deuterium in water So I have another question here. <clears throat> What's up with those vertical tubes? This is how we recreate the hydrological cycle. This is known as vacuum assisted rectification distillation. And we have a bunch of them, dozens and dozens of them. And these crank, these separate the light water from the, from the normal water, which is 150 parts per million. And we take out 94 to 97% reduce that 150 ppm down to 5 and 10 ppm not much difference between 5 and 10 so the most if you want to do this then uh, i recommend the 10 parts per million we have it in glass and plastic the plastic is the cheapest uh, we test everything and uh, there's nothing that leaches out of our plastic everything is shipped temperature controlled everything is we we uh, I I wouldn't you know I wouldn't sell anything I wouldn't take myself so I I drink from the from the 10 ppm plastic bottles uh, but we do make glass available for those that like glass as well the point is that over time over a period of 45 to 90 days you do it consistently you'll get down to the 120 ppm range we also have uh, oh yeah this is one of the slides that never made it. I was going to show you that we have our own laboratory. We have a we have a testing lab, and uh, we bought this uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollar analyzer. It took a took a year to tune, but now we can measure saliva or any water, uh, and uh, we do this for people. So you can see if this is working for you or not. Typically, people if they want they do a baseline test. Not really necessary because. You can guess where your deuterium levels are. They're going to be between 140 and 155. So after three months of drinking light water, you send in a saliva test, and you can see how far you got down. And, uh, and then you uh, just maintain that. Now, I also recommend, I don't have it here. I thought I had it here. But there's a great book uh, by uh, a colleague of ours. His name is Dr. Gabor Shamlai. He has been doing this since the 80s. This, uh, he's, he has over 3,000 case studies in uh, using deuterium depletion successfully uh, in oncology. He doesn't, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't stop whatever anybody is doing when they're being treated with cancer. So chemo or herbs, whatever your, whatever your program is, he doesn't change it. But he gives you deuterium depleted water. And now he's up to three thousand, over three thousand case studies in twenty-five years, and he's got a couple books out. And his latest one came out uh, this year, and uh, it's called Deuterium Depletion, and uh, it's quite phenomenal because uh, the 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 um, the conclusion that he's come to after th over three with over three thousand case studies with people that have cancer, he found that there's an eight to 10x survivability factor of when you're on deuterium depleted water versus not. So people that were drinking deuterium depleted water on average survived eight to 10 times longer with whatever cancer they had. And in many cases, it went into remission. And 
this is not the water doing anything. This is your own body, which is a self self healing organism. It's just less burdened by deuterium. So when you have more metabolic energy, your self healing abilities kick in rather nicely. So what I noticed myself after being on deuterium with water after six months was the healing process. Not only uh, does your metabolism vastly improve, but uh, your ability to heal actually improves. So that's what I found personally. We don't share too many of our testimonials on our website because of uh, this FDA problem. But um, sure enough, it, it works. So you're saying that people can send in their saliva to be tested, right? Yeah, you have to buy a kit, and we send you the kit. You use the kit. Uh, you uh, get a little saliva, uh, ten mil, ten little like uh, ten milliliters worth, and then you send it in. 10, 10, 14 days. We'll give you your results. So last I last I tested, I was at a hundred parts per million, and most people are at one hundred and fifty. So uh, how much does that cost to do that test? It's uh, two hundred dollars for a saliva test, and then we have we sometimes we give discounts that take it all the way down by another fifteen to twenty percent. And that test is like a one-time shot. You don't have like you can take it then drink the water then take it again. Uh, you can, you can. What we do is for people that are are for people that have every year. If you're with us for a year or more as a light water customer, we send you out a free test just so you just so you know that you're maintaining this. Now, that said, the studies also show that even drinking this one week a month has benefit. So uh, if you can't afford to do it constantly, you'll 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 do you'll do some good for yourself just to have it periodically as well. The key is but if you're but if you're suffering from some from some illness, it's good to go down by 20% and then stay there because you're going to, it, there's nothing else that provides a net energy benefit like deuterium depletion, nothing. And this has to do with mitochondrial energy and, and the uh, energy conservation, so which increases your self-healing ability. It's, a, it's, all a, it's just all an energy game, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I'd be interested to see what it would do to diabetes, you know. Uh, there's some number, number of studies on diabetes. Very, very great, very, very good results. Very good results. You can, if you go to deuteriumdepletion.org, there's a number of studies or just search for it online, diabetes and uh, deuterium depletion. You'll find a few things out there. there my colleagues uh, have done um, extensive study on this and, and there's a, uh, Absolutely a positive benefit to anybody suffering from diabetes once their deuterium depleted. Okay, we have a question. Oh, okay, they answered it themselves. So keep in mind that there's not much difference between 5 and 10. So we did 5 ppm because we could. It makes us the, makes us the lowest deuterium depleted water on the planet. Uh, it's something no one else can do. And... Uh, it's more expensive, but when you look, when you compare it to 10 parts per million, let's say you, uh, let's say you mix it one to one with a regular drinking water. So if you mix 10 parts per million one to one with 150 ppm, you get 80. And if you mix five ppm with 150 ppm water one to one, you get 77. So in the long run, there's really no difference. But uh, we wanted to have the most super deuterium depleted water on the planet. Uh, so we went down to 5 ppm. In fact, our 5 ppm tests a little lower even. It's like 3.5 ppm. and We can even go lower. But the, the point is that in our biology, that we get ourselves down into the 120 ppm range. That's where the bulk of the benefit is. And if you want to go further, you can. Some people have gotten down into 80 ppm. And uh, but the but our biology is really really works best at uh, between 100 and 130, and some even say 120 you know, 120 to 125. This is the whole science of deuteronomics, which anybody that's interested in it, I encourage them 
to uh, dive in because it's it's phenomenal. There a lot of the we have a lot of uh, unanswered questions in uh, biochemistry, and deuterium answers those questions. It's a missing puzzle piece. Okay, well, if no one has any other questions, uh, I'd like to encourage you to come to our conference that's coming up in, um, in August. Well, yeah, I very much would like to. I, 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 we pre Robert, my partner, Robert Slovak, and I presented there in 2019. We and shared that, the stage. And that, and that DVD, good. by the way, is on, available online on our YouTube channel. So you might want to go check it up if you haven't seen it yet. No, um, it's a I anybody that anybody that is interested in uh, alternative energy or these types of esoteric subjects, I highly encourage them to go to Tesla Tech. I I met some people there uh, whose books I had re read before, and it was just it was it was awesome to meet these people in person. It was just it was, it was great. Anyway, yeah, so. Um, We'll see you, uh, well, hopefully, at the uh, conference and that. And uh, I'd like to encourage everyone who liked this, uh, this presentation to be sure to punch that uh, thumbs up uh, button at the bottom of your screen there on YouTube and uh, make, give them a like, you know. And if you if you want more information, you can go to our website, drinklightwater.com. Lightwater is spelled L-I-T-E. W A T E R, drinklightwater.com. We also have deuteriumtest.com. That's the testing lab. And uh, I encourage people to download our free guide. It's uh, the deuterium depletion guide, and, and it uh, goes over many of the things that I spoke about today. And so uh, thank you for being with us, Victor. And uh, like I say, uh, I hope to see you in August, and I hope to be in touch with you. In the very near future, and uh, like I say, you know, we're always looking for articles for our magazine and everything, too. So, oh, yeah, one more question here. Bring it on. I wonder how that would work with HHO breathing used in Weisman's system. I think it, with what breathing? Well, it's gas. You know, it's the hydrogen system, or you breathe in hydrogen. So I have, I have, a, I have a few Browns gas machines myself, and I... And I um, use deuterium depleted water in those machines because when that water molecule breaks in the hydrogen and oxygen, you're going to get the same proportion of deuterium in the gas as you will uh, in the water. So if you're using deuterium depleted water in your Brown's gas machine, you'll get you'll get deuterium depleted. Uh, you'll get more protium, more hydrogen one than uh, hydrogen two deuterium when you breathe it. So yeah, it's it works great. Complimentary, complimentary in a Brown's gas uh, therapy session. And here's another question here. Is there no way to probe water with a meter? Uh, no, you need a, um, you either need mass spec, which takes a long time per sample, or you need uh, ring down, uh, ring down spectroscopy, um, cavity ring down spectroscopy, it's called and uh, uh to um for the delta deuterium that's the only way it's very it's a very expensive very finicky machine and uh yeah otherwise there's really just no way to tell what the deuterium concentration in the water is you got to have a there's only two companies in the world that make them okay well anyway uh be sure uh, we're getting ready to leave here so be sure to uh, punch that out Thumbs up, you know, and uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And, and, if you uh, have, and if you have any more specific questions, just uh, email us. If you want to get a hold of me, call our 800 number or email us, and um, I'm uh, easily accessible. You can always uh, get a hold of me to answer any of your uh, questions. Uh, what do they do with the deuterium? That's a good question. So we don't, we don't get any D2O from our process. Like, we don't get any heavy water. Uh, we only get uh, semi-heavy water, and uh, when we make water that's 5 and 10 ppm, uh, the effluent water is about 165 or 170, and that just goes back into the ground. And we'll, oh, got another one here. Is Icelandic water DDW? No, 
I'm glad you asked. No. Uh, so Icelandic water is, is, Iceland is surrounded by the ocean. So it's not going to be deuterium depleted at all. If you want deuterium depleted water, you're going to, uh, if you want a natural deuterium depleted water, you're going to want to select a glacial spring water. So uh, let's look at the United States for, for, for a second. The eastern slope of the Rockies has uh, deuterium content uh, that's about 138 to 140 parts per million. So like if you're in Boulder, Colorado, it's uh, 139 out the tap. So, um, the, yeah, because you're away from the hydrological cycle. The ocean's 155.76. So if you're in a localized weather pattern away from the ocean, then you'll have less deuterium in the groundwater. So uh, typically glaciers, because they're water that's locked up in time from thousands of years ago, will also have less deuterium. So if you want a naturally deuterium the water, you're going to select a glacial spring water. So, so Tom also asks, uh, is uh, Greenland melting glacial water, DEW? Some of it. Uh, if you go all the way to the North Pole, the water there is about 100 and between 105 and 112 parts per million, which is great if you can get it. Really, if you want to, uh, the best thing to do is to tow an iceberg from Antarctica. Antarctica is the lowest on the planet. And if you drill down, when the Russians drill down to Lake Vostok, which is, I think, what is it, like a half a mile or a mile below a, a cover of a, a, you have to drill through like a, a mile of ice or something. It's that, uh, it's that lake in Antarctica that's covered by, uh, by ice. When they drill down there, uh, they found that the water there is 85 parts per million. So the highest, lowest on the planet is 85 or 89, uh, which is on the surface of Antarctica. And the highest uh, is uh, the rains in the Sahara Desert right before the, um, right at the end of the dry sea, at the beginning of the wet season. It seems like it might be worth to go to Antarctica there and uh, bring back a tanker of water. You know, what's <laughs> interesting is those people that uh, I spoke to those scientists at McMurdo Station, uh, they they measure everything over there, including deuterium, mm -hmm. and they were telling me about uh, how all, all these how people say you know when they after Antarctica all these uh, ailments that they have go away, uh, like they get healthier, more energy, better sleep, uh, aches and pains that they had just disappear, and they didn't they never put two and two together, and I told them it's just because you're drinking deuterium depleted water for an extended period of time. So yeah, if you could tow an iceberg from uh, from uh, Antarctica, you know we would have a we would solve a lot of uh, health problems for many people. Wow! So they could put a resort down there. <laughs> have people just, stay there for a month or two, you know? Yeah, it's just it's just it's just cold. <laughs> Because you'll be drinking it and uh, showering yeah. in it. Yeah, you know? it'd, be it'd be nice. It'd be nice. Yeah. Or, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's in these extreme areas where humans don't live that you find the most deuterium depleted water. But if you're in the, like I said, certain places uh, in the United States, places that are away from the hydrological cycle, eastern slope of the Rockies, you're going to find a, uh, a water that's, 10 to 15 ppm less and uh the uh, over time that's incredible over time that's a, that's an incredible benefit a net energy benefit because the um, um the benefit is um the best the benefit is happens over time well, here's one more uh do you think we can make a membrane and charge it with electrons to bind the proton in the d water and ship the d water in deep space um I think what causes the uh, deuterium is the neutron, right? That's right. It's that neutron, yeah. So it went, that wouldn't help. I encourage everybody or any scientist out there to try and crack this puzzle because right now we can – It's it, it took an enormous amount of money, millions and millions of dollars to build our factory right now, and we can only make a very small amount of water. So this is really going to shift – 
humanity in the future, somebody's going to have to invent a better process. It's like uh, it's like sitting around a campfire in 1860 and imagining the light bulb will be invented. Eventually it will, and it was. And so somebody will come up with a process where everybody can do this at home rather easily without the immense energy input that's required. But uh, that doesn't exist right now. It's going to take a, so it's going to take somebody uh, that has the acumen of a Nikola Tesla, if you will, to figure this riddle, this problem out. But I think eventually somebody will. Okay. And then you have you ever drink Volvic? Uh, I have not. I don't, I don't know if Volvic has been tested. It may have. A lot of water has been tested. And, and like I said, a general rule is a glacial spring water is going to be depleted in deuterium more so than uh, something that's uh, uh, not a glacial source. And then let's make this the last one here. Joe Selcrow pretended that the device worked because of trap. Because of what? Joe I guess you're talking about Joe Selwa. Well, yeah, electrolysis is one. Electrolysis is, is is one way. It's not very efficient. There's there's a there's a there's a few processes that are not as efficient. Our process, which is vacuum assisted rectification distillation, is is the most efficient process right now to reduce the deuterium or the now now we don't. It's not deuterium. It's it's HDO that is the problem. You know, one out of every one out of every thirty three hundred molecules of water is HDO, and one out of every forty one million is D two O. So D two O, there's really not much of it. Uh, HDO is the problem. So if you can figure out how to remove this HDO through, there's they haven't been able to figure out how to do it with a membrane yet. There's no membrane that exists, but eventually there may be. Okay, and um, I'm just going to close with that. And um, I do have a, a method of uh, making uh, deuterium free water coming up in one of our next issues, a homemade version. Well, um, you, can't, you can't do it by fractional freezing. That doesn't work. Well, he has a, he has a process. But we put the stuff in our magazine just as a point of information and people to try. Now, if you want to try it and you think you got something, send yeah. us a sample. We'll test it in. We'll test it in our lab and tell you if you got anything. First, you got to build the equipment. <laughs> we have so. the lab. We have the lab. We can tell you if you got if you if you got anywhere or not. Like they people, you know, John Ellis was saying he had to turn bleed of water, and it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, a test doesn't lie. So, uh, but if you're, if you're tinkering around, experimenting, this is how I, I, I started doing the uh, ice fractionation method and, and uh, it doesn't work. If you do the, if you do the, if you do the ice process 20 times, you might get, you know, a quarter to a half part per million. It's, it's, it doesn't work. So it's very hard to separate that HDO molecule. I, and I, and, and that's what I understand too, you know, but like I say, you now this, uh, uh, a suggestion here and now, now we know where we go to get it tested yeah yeah so this will open up we've we've created this resource for inventors as well so you can so you can uh maybe you maybe maybe who knows? Maybe, maybe yeah who knows maybe somebody has something i would you know i i, I i'm more interested in the progress uh, the evolutionary process for humanity in terms of making this available to more people. So if somebody comes up with a process to put us out of business, that's fine, you know, but we, right now we use the process that we have. And if somebody comes up with a way to do it better, awesome. Okay. But anyway, uh, it's been a great night and um, we'll see you in the near future and I'll be in touch with you because there's some things we got going. Okay. Thanks, Steve. It was a pleasure. Okay. Have a great night. Right. Take care.